<laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The intersection of technology and science is less of an intersection and more of a braided stream, splitting off and feeding back upon itself again and again. Along the banks of this stream, science makes discoveries that make technology possible. Oh, and technology makes tools that make new discoveries in science possible, leading to greater advancements in technology, better tools. And more science! We need more tech so we can use more tools so we can do more science. I mean, they couldn't exist without each other? I think that's it. You can never have a conflict between them because each only exists as a collaboration with the other. They help each other out. Precisely. So, while we always love technology, today we're going to dig in deeper on how it crosses over with This Week in Science and Daily Tech News Show coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. This, this, this <laughs> is, oh my gosh, what is this? This is This Week in the Daily Science and Tech News Show podcast. A mashup of This Week in Science and the Daily Tech News Show. Okay, Tom, tell us about DTNS. What are you doing here? Who are you? <laughs> what, are, what are you doing here? Your chocolate's in my peanut butter. Wait, your exactly. peanut butter's in my chocolate. Uh, daily Tech News Show is what it says on the tin. Uh, it's a daily show about technology news. We try to help people understand the world of technology, make them the smartest in the room when other people are talking about technology by just kind of putting everything in context every day. And uh, I do it with an amazing group of people, including my co-host, Sarah Lane. Hello, Sarah Lane. Hello, everybody. Hello, tech people. Hello, science people. We are all one. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And uh, our producer, Roger Chang. Hi, Roger. Hello, all. Hello, Roger. Meet Twist. Greetings, Twist. I know two of them. I've talked to the third remotely. <laughs> we'll so, you all um, get the so, best. Who? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Kiki, uh, we have explained DTNS. What the heck is Twist? Twist is a weekly science talk show variety show. We bring the weekly science news. We talk. We introduce it. We discuss it. We come up with questions. We like to inspire curiosity in people. And you know, even though we maybe don't have as many water cooler conversations anymore, we want to make you the most interesting person at that cocktail party or water cooler when people can start hanging out again. So wait a minute. If you listen to Daily Tech News Show and This Week in Science, you will dominate cocktail parties. Absolutely. You will yeah. always have something intelligent and amazing to talk about. People will be like, what? What are these things that you know? It'll be amazing. But we have, we've come together for this episode. Yeah. Who my co-hosts here. Who I've got my co-hosts here. Yes. Justin, right there. Where are you? Say hi, Justin. Hi, Justin. Um, I'm in, uh, broadcasting from a Central European time in the great state of Denmark. That's fantastic. Thank you for joining us in the middle of your night. Blair. Hey hello. Hey-o. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> it's good. Blair is our animal zoologist host. Justin is our opinionologist. I'm the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> we like to split it up. But we've come together with DTNS. Why? Why have we done this? Well, uh, there, there's an intersection uh, of science and technology. Uh, and I listen to This Week in Science and I think, oh, that's a really interesting aspect of a story that that we did uh, on DTNS or, or that could have been a story or or I'm just, you know, hearing uh, about the fact that uh, when I scream out of joy, it means I have an evolutionary advantage. So I, I learn a lot <laughs> from twists and I, I thought, man, we, we do cross over from time to time. So 
I, I wanted to I, I wanted to see if maybe we could uh, we could bring those powers together for even better understanding. The powers for understanding the world around us and hopefully having a really good time bringing science and technology, peanut butter and chocolate together. Right. I mean, we have crossed over. I've gotten to be on DTNS. Blair's been on DTNS. Justin, you've been on DTNS, yes? No. Not yet? No. See, and Sarah has yet to be on Twist. So these are things that we still need to work out. But Roger and Tom, you've been on Twist. Yeah, yeah. We've Good done time. these yeah. individual crossovers. So now we have the Hollywood Squares Brady Bunch of science and technology. We're trying it's to build their bingo our... cards. We're getting there. <laughs> We're almost, we, we've almost won bingo. Just a few, just a few little... So well, close. Well, checks left. Yeah. I know. Gotta get there. <laughs> All right, Tom. Let's tell people where they can find us on our regular shows, and let's dive in. Let's make this show. Yeah, go. yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about the intersection of of technology and science. We're gonna do some philosophical musing, uh, talk about some stories, do some trivia. Uh, but if you like what you hear and you want more technology, you can find us at dailytechnewsshow.com. And you can find Twists at twists.org. All right. What are we starting with? We're going to start with a question from Josh. Uh, we, we got a, a bunch of emails, both shows did, uh, mm -hmm. suggesting things to talk about. We're going to talk about a lot of them on the show. But Josh in particular asked, when did science and technology become two separate things? In the 80s, they used to be covered mostly together. But in the last decade, technology has mostly come to mean things coming from some of the big names in the game. When did CRISPR become science? While a real estate company like WeWork, where tech work is done, become a tech company? Oh, well, I would argue that WeWork is not a tech company. Uh, but I, th <laughs> I, I yeah. think people working in the tech sector used WeWork as a co-working space. I mean, there are many, but it was a very popular one around the world. And, you know, some of them are really fancy and everything. But, I mean, there's nothing really tech about it except that a lot of people working in tech would hang out there or drop the name or do a lot of travel and, and hang out at WeWorks. But I get your point, Josh. And it's funny because I do think science and technology are very intrinsically uh, intertwined. intertwined. Yes, exactly. In fact, I mean, I can almost think of there are not that many technology stories that I don't also think, well, that is science. You know, it's just a kind of science. Um, and there's probably a little bit more vice versa than ever on the science side because there's so much technology involved. It does sort of bother me, though, you know, when you get a drop down menu where you're trying to I don't know, define yourself or your show or, or, or just pick a category. And it's like, blah, 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 entertainment, music, science and technology. It's always the two together. And I yeah. sometimes want, I want a little bit more detail on each because both of those things can be many different things. It's there. There's such huge categories that I feel like we need a lot more subcategories to make it make sense. I, I, I think the shift notably happened like where you, there was a, definite segmentation is when technology became a business concern as well where we're making money and the 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 economic aspect suddenly thrust what used to be collectively kind of the science tech you know biology life sciences they they grouped them all together was now its own thing because a lot more people cared about this particular aspect because it involved dollars and cents as opposed to science which is very important for a lot of things, but for the average news viewer, it might have been considered an esoteric piece that you would read along with the sports pages. But when it came to like things like where do I put my investment, you know, which company should I buy a, you know, A, B, C, or D product from, you know, that's a technology thing. Probably, but you know, I I would say somewhere in probably the latter half of the '90s, you would you start to see that shift, at least for yeah. My... And I think that's it. It. it... Companies like Google came out of computer science research projects. They were, it was, it was science at a point developing an algorithm. What is, the, what is this thing? How do we explain it? And creating the knowledge around a search al algorithm. That was the computer science aspect. And then they took it, rolled it out into a company. And that is something that happens much more often nowadays where the research, the science, the development of that knowledge then gets turned into application. How can we take the science of CRISPR 
this aspect of microbial biology, this thing that is just naturally happening in bacteria, and turn it into a probably multi-billion dollar technology that's going to be used by researchers around the world for decades to come and probably turned into even new technologies. It, it's so it's so interesting you say that because one of the upcoming fields is biotech, right? Mm -hmm. What Yay. used to be life sciences, biology research, you know, uh, what my sister used to do, which was uh, uh, microbiology, is now becoming a business. And so now you got to segment it out because, again, people want to know, where do I invest? Is this something that's going to make or make me or make my company or perhaps make my, you know, city or state if the, the government invests in it, you know, a return. And so, I mean, it's weird. As soon as you put a dollar symbol on something, it, how you perceive it such shifts yeah. dramatically. It's when it becomes a product, right? It's yeah. when, it, when, as soon as there's a science delivers a product, it gets separated out. And because we're talking about like from maybe from the eighties, but cars was science technology. I mean, like every, like radio was, a, TVs were these breakthroughs, but they didn't keep talking about the science be behind how your TV works. That stopped immediately after the thing was invented. And then they were like, maybe one day science will invent colors and figure out a way to do that. So I think we separate, it's, I think it's always separated. I think it comes together for these brief moments. When I, when I saw, heard this question, uh, I, the first thing I thought about was, when we invented the first stone tool. Well, not us, you know, it was uh, Homo habilis like three million that. years yeah, ago. Yeah, I remember. And then, and then, and that may actually, there's a whole thing there where like, that might actually be why we're bipedal. That might actually be why we got big brains is because we started messing with this tool and manipulating it and wanting to set it down. So you can't climb a tree if you got your favorite stone tool. <laughs> and then if you're if you're making stone tools, you need to use both the hands together. So you're not going to hold your weight with it. So a lot of human evolution may have actually started with a piece of tech first. But then it was a million years or so before we changed that stone tool. And then that stone tool, that big advanced stone tool stuck with us for two million years before somebody thought of changing it. Could you imagine right. being the beta user for two million years? <laughs> yeah, it took a really the beta long time. Doctor. Oh man, right. we're whoa, still whoa, whoa. in Our testing. Later, our brains this is had Google. To get bigger first. I mean, <laughs> over a million years, is it really a beta test or is it just a slow evolution of a... It's a Google beta test. Yeah, It's a Google but, beta, yeah. You know, people talk about these, these phones, uh, handheld devices as being crafted to fit the human hand. No, humans, humans have been crafted around a handheld tool since we started being upright, like we've had a handheld tool in our hand throughout all of before human, current modern human evolution, <laughs> millions of years. Yeah. What, what yeah. do you got there, Tom? Yeah, just a, one of my original stone tools that I was trying out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've been <laughs> lugging those around for three million years. So this is not this is not some strange new thing that happened where we're going to pick up this device that we carry in our hands all the time. We've always done this. This is always how humans have been on the planet. I, I feel like when, when I think about this intersection, I think about science being the story that we might have figured something out. We've got evidence that something is happening. We're, we're, we tried something out in a lab and we think we can make it work. And when we cover those on Daily Tech News Show, it's usually like, and if they can make it work, this is what you'll be able to do with it, right? Technology is the application of like, okay, when, like you were saying, Justin, it's a product. When can I get it in my hands? When can I do something with it? Uh, and science is what makes technology possible. It's almost a subset, really. Well, yeah, science is that that one uh, 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 Australopithecus or whatever. <laughs> it's throwing, that's throwing an apple at a mastodon. That didn't work well. Uh, and then, hey, maybe a, a stick, a small stick. Yeah, that didn't do anything. And then eventually got around to a stone that hit it. And, you know, like, okay, that had an effect. Let's, let's concentrate on the rocks and see if we can find the right size that we can both throw and take out them or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And then once that, I think once the, they was like, okay, now we're starting to, uh, we have what's going to be a stone. We're going to throw it. Here's how we're going to throw it. Here's the size and weight it should be. Oh, it's you know, the perfecting of that is that's what I usually think of as technology. Once it takes off and becomes uh, 
people are innovating on it and making it better and improving, making these little improvements stepwise to make the best version of a thing that you throw at something or whatever it is. That's sort of my vision of of what technology is until science comes up with a whole other thing. And then then technology, because of the iteration of technology, then science is able to do more. So it's this feedback loop also. Science creates technologies, technologies enable science, and they drive each other. Right, because you you make the science that makes the phone possible, and then the phone starts to be used in research, which then makes other things possible, and round and round it goes. Uh, and, and, And to carry Justin's metaphor even farther, once everybody's got a hand axe, suddenly it's still technology, but nobody thinks of it that way. It's just common, oh, right? It's just, yeah. just a thing. Nobody's impressed that you have an Italian yeah. hand axe a million years ago because they've been around for a million years. And they're going to be around for another million. Humans, by the way, did massively uh, innovate the smaller versions of the tools. We are the ones who were like, hey, that's a great idea. Let's make it smaller. <laughs> that's, that's when we took over stone tool making. I got little pockets. We did the same I like to thing. put them in my little female pockets. But we just made them all smaller and smaller so we could do more delicate work. You're like, I like that, but yeah, it doesn't fit too big in my pocket. I want, one, I want one I can put on my wrist and carry around with me and then go do some scraping of tendons later. This has <laughs> been absolutely no change in our desire as humans. Smaller technology. I- I do wonder about, though, like the way that science feeds into technology and technology feeding into science. Is there ever, uh, you know, we we run into issues every once in a while with the challenges to how how technology is implemented, how people use it. We run into um, issues where the science isn't moving fast enough to be able to keep up with the pace of the information that people want. And then there's also the ethics around how you how you do the science and also the technology. We're talking about so many ethical issues in technology stuff today. So there's, it's not just happy, happy, joy, joy. I think there's also a lot of challenges in how the two work together moving forward as well. Yeah, and I think that is one of the things technology looks for more often maybe than in the past is help us understand the effect of this technology because it's having effects faster and at a wider level than it used to uh and 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 especially the 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 social sciences and and economic sciences are are being pushed more than ever before to to look at the effects that technology has and well, and if what... I can just, if okay. I can say something yep. about the premise of this question for a second, um, I think that this kind of speaks to the human's urge to categorize things, which mm. I, I talk about a lot, but ultimately that's what this is about, right? Is that we better understand things when we can see what things are similar, categorize them, put them into nice little boxes, but they don't always fit. And so when science and technology have expanded so much over the last however many decades because of the improvement of all of it, mostly technology that helps us get science, right? That then helps us get more technology, that back and forth, that the the breadth of knowledge available out there has caused us to have to find these delineations to better understand the world, which again, they're never going to be perfect. There's a, there's a story that I might call a science story and you might call a tech story and there's going to be overlap. And that's something that on Daily Tech News Show, we talk about all the time. You know, there are stories where we're like, this is such a cool story, but is it tech enough for this show, particular mm-hmm. show? And of course it depends on the day. You know, there's certain days where it's like, yeah, it fits. It kind of flows with the other stuff that we're talking about. Other days we go, it's science, but it's not totally tech. And that is often a really gray area. Um, and we have a portion of the show that we sort of dedicate to stories like that, where it's like, it's it's more science than tech, but it's cool and we're gonna do it. And and that's great, but uh, but yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that does come up pretty often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm thinking though, that this will kind of, Josh's question in our conversation here can kind of take us into the next segment of the game, of the game, of the show. This is game show that the we show. have going you've, on. You've revealed the, the truth. The show is I just one big game. One yeah. big game, it is, yes. I have a game that I wanna play with everybody. 
Have you ever heard of the game Never Have I Ever? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to change it a little bit, and we're going to play Never Would I Ever. And I want you to think about some of these questions that this – the driving force of technology and science are making possible and bringing into it it seems like sci-fi but it's not so much sci-fi it's becoming real and some of the questions that the listeners addressed to us in their suggestions kind of bring up there were a lot of overlaps between a lot of questions and a lot of suggestions and so here's questions for you I want you to tell the audience whether or not you would do this thing and then if we get into the why or the why not, and maybe we can change each other's minds. Maybe, just maybe. I want to hear people's arguments. Let's debate. Would you, there's a story out this week on a monkey-human chimera, embryos that have been created. Would you ever create a monkey-human chimera? Would you mix human and monkey cells. Hmm. Maybe. See, at one level, I'm just to prove that I could do it. Just I be mean, like, hey, look what I did. But I, I mean, ch- chimeras generally don't live very long. So, I mean, it, if you're asking not with me that what attitude, I, they don't. Well, no, I, well, no, I mean, <laughs> well like, not if you don't help them. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're asking you if I create a human monkey hybrid creature like one that's birthed and like you know alive Mm -hmm. that would be different than just dealing with the cells for example if i was doing Mm -hmm. some sort of gene sequencing and then i decided to oh let me see what some rhesus monkey genes over here might do i mean for me i i think i think i'm okay with that it's then taking it beyond that like where you want to create a a, a, an organism that you know is in homeostasis and and the rest of it and it's alive and it's doing all its things that's eh, a little more creepy i think but when of, i oh, go ahead yeah. go oh no you you first <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just gonna say i think that usually when we do when we talk about chimeras you picture this crazy sci-fi thing but really it's like but what if you had the lungs of a monkey <laughs> which fine i mean we put we put pig uh arteries in our body all the time right Mm -hmm. so to a certain extent if this is going to help the medical field it it doesn't really bother me at all i mean i mean they have glow in the dark fish i mean it's not like they were naturally found in the wild that way oh but you don't well, know I think, I think some of them are right that's how they well, no, they, 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 they bioengineer they like aquarium yeah. in the deep blue sea deep okay so there blair is, this yeah. actually this is actually the question that i was going to ask what what you were just describing because in the nature.com article that was describing you know the, the research advancement that had happened and the fact that um you know we've got these chimera embryos that are living not for very long but longer than they had in the past and the fact that scientists are a little split on whether or not this is a good idea and 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 where it's really going my my question was okay well if it's about being able to create organs that could be transplanted into humans to help a human survive or even an animal really but let's go with humans for now great well why would a hybrid be better than just me having a monkey lung from mm-hmm. a monkey embryo well, you know what's I- wh- why why does that get stronger well, the idea is that if you have a hybrid, for example, I mean, I remember this chimera, this, yeah. 15 years ago, they were kicking around the idea of doing pig human mm-hmm. chimeras because then the pig could grow whatever, your liver. And, and then, they are doing that too. And you could, they are. Which, right? The idea, of course, is when you do an animal to human transplant, there's always a high risk of uh, uh, organ rejection. rejection to your body because it's like, Dude, you're trying to attach something to me that doesn't belong oh, here. Oh, so so more of the human cells in there means possibly more that it well, takes. You, yeah, you could grow a lung that is possibly, uh, you know, an orders of magnitude more compatible with a person than if you just tried to take it out of a, a run of the mill. Okay, okay. Then my question is flipped. Where where does the animal make this stronger? Well, well the, you, the, I got that. I got that. Because if you don't have the animal there at all, then you've got a human you're taking the organ from. And that's, oh, that's a need different to be set of ethical issues. 
<laughs> yeah, right there. There may be deceased, and, and it gets weirder yeah, from maybe? there. Maybe, yeah. hopefully, yeah. I don't no, know. No, no, that's it. You have like, a body farm of other humans, yeah. then we're in a whole different yeah. sci-fi. Got it. Yes, future. I think I've seen a few movies the about island, this. Is this yeah. island or whatever. Never ended well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Tom, do you okay, have an opinion? I I mean, would I know? Because they, they probably just wouldn't take. I'm just not very good at at, at that. Uh, would would I want someone else to do it? May I go? I go with the maybe of I think this is important for research, but it's certainly a, a situation that has to have a lot of guidelines and discussion and people looking over each other's shoulder, accountability, and all that sort of thing. But yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's something that is is wrong to pursue at all. Yeah, I agree. I I think this research is fantastic. I would, if I could, <laughs> create a chimera. I would be that scientist. I'd be like, let's put these things together, and I want to know. I want to know answers to evolutionary questions about human brains and where they came from. What genes in the ape family are responsible with, that changed or didn't change what rna is responsible what proteins like i would i would want to know those evolutionary questions um and so i think from a research standpoint it's fantastic from a potential to create organs the pig human yeah. chimeras that stuff it's so valuable uh and i i look forward to the day that it happens so we get the planet of the apes and then you'll be sorry yeah Yes. But I think this is actually comes a little bit to the question we were asked before about the ethics. Uh, it, at some point, it seems like science gets to start this, but the, te the technology of actually doing this reliably is so far into the future, we think, right. that we don't have to really worry or think right. too much about the ethical thing. <laughs> so if that all falls on tech at some point, and science is like, oh, yeah, we're, we're just, just an idea when we had it. <laughs> we weren't actually going to do anything with so, it. So <laughs> Facebook's new winged monkeys. Uh, I'm not so cool with that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I honestly think every science and tech person should take ethics courses before they are allowed to get into business of anything. I don't know. Maybe right. everybody should. And, yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody. and you, and you need to pass those Ooh. courses. You just can't take it and drop it two weeks later. <laughs> no. <laughs> that would All be right, very next, ethical. Next question. Would you or wouldn't you inject yourself with nanoparticles? Uh, only if they've been thoroughly vetted on someone else. Oh, so you don't <laughs> want to be first. the beta tester. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, because we got Dan and Javon both uh, asked about this, the, the idea of in, injecting nanoparticles in our body. And to me, it's no different than, than inj uh, injecting any other particle mm -hmm. in our body. Uh, which is, uh, has it been tested? Has it been thoroughly vetted? Am I doing it for a good reason? You know, is it gonna is it gonna cure my cancer? Uh, and and it's been clinically tried to, to be relatively safe. Then then sure. Is is it like I don't know what it'll do? We haven't tried it before. No. Uh, then you're not injecting those nanoparticles in me. Not at all. Yeah, I think uh, loyal Twist listeners will know that I plan on living over 200 years. And this is exactly how, is as soon as medical advances exist and have been through clinical trials, I want it. I want it immediately. <laughs> Give me the nanoparticles. Yeah. What do you want them to I, do, though? Just, just prolong life? That, do you just want just them to take stuff? space? Take up space or, like, turn you into a tree? <laughs> They're very what small, are my Roger. Options? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want menu. to be a long-lived organism, you're either a jellyfish or a sequoia. What kind of nanoparticles would you like? Is it just uh, microplastics? Yeah. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't need any more of those. But if it's like, yeah, okay, if it's gonna, gonna, if go it's to gonna patrol brain. my bloodstream, yeah, I'm, I'm maybe I'm on Blair's <laughs> side if it's gonna fix stuff, yeah. But if, yeah, if this is gonna go up into connected somewhere into my uh, dendrites, and now I can understand any language, and I, I now know what the squirrels are talking about. Uh, that might be fun. I might be interested in seeing what every what everything is talking about around me. Yeah, there's a, a sci-fi story, and I'm blanking on the name of the author right now, but there are nanoparticles that you ingest, and they incorporate into your brain to create something of a neural net that allows you to connect to the internet with your brain so that you can then be one with the information of the universe uh, that, that of the internet that sounds terrible yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> how would you know the questions of your brain being hacked and all this? You know, it brings it, up all sorts of like questions. It's like a YouTube live stream all the time. <laughs> all the time. I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm just worried about connectivity. Like it's, not, it's, it's gonna, you know, it's always gonna go out. It's gonna freeze. I'm gonna be waiting for an answer for like 20 minutes because the network. Yeah, can down. you imagine? You're like, we're gonna kill it trivia tonight, and you're like, ah, oh, crap, I'm offline. <laughs> <laughs> Not connected. Sorry, I got no connection here. Your stream of consciousness is bogarting all my bandwidth. <laughs> Your stream of consciousness is buffering. And you get so used to the constant connection that you can't do anything without a connection. So right. as soon as you go yeah. offline, you're like, how? How do I? How do I boil water again? <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, no need to so commit quiet. anything to memory. I don't know. Yeah, but there needs to be definitely that continued research uh, and <laughs> clinical trials. Don't just inject nanoparticles. Although I know there are some DIY bio people out there who will just inject nanoparticles and, and other things because that's what they're doing. It's let DIY. us learn from them. Yeah, we will. But, we will. <laughs> yes, but yeah, I, I, think, right. I think the whole thing yeah. is what is the function? What is the thing that you want it to do? If Are we talking about this yeah, yeah. versus getting chemotherapy, this versus getting a surgery? Are we talking about this is a cosmetic uh, appeal or a, you know, I need enough of a reason to do anything. But I mean, people will radiate their bodies with poison mm -hmm. to fight cancer. Yeah. Okay. So we know there's a point where, yes, we all would probably say that's fine. That's a good solution to whatever I'm up against. But uh, just casually, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Take a shot, nanoparticle shot. All right, next question. Would you clone a mammoth? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's it's everyone but Blair. Was a setup question, wasn't it? It was. For those of I you who attacked, watch. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> it, was. it, was. it wasn't me. I promise I didn't sneak this one in. Oh, oh, thank you, Jeremy Fath, for that donation. Really appreciate that. Um, You're welcome. Every... <laughs> uh, <laughs> So longtime Twist listeners will know that we have an ongoing debate on Twist about whether or not mammoths should be cloned and reanimated. So here's the question. Would you ever clone an endangered species that's still alive, i.e. the uh, red-footed ferret that, uh, was, yeah. that it was recently cloned for conservation purposes? Would you ever clone... Something like a mammoth, which has been long dead, but bring it back. Would you ever clone a person? Mm. Which one of those? Any of them? So, like, we do we have to? So we have to answer. So, for endangered species, yes. <laughs> although I, there are concerns of of low genetic diversity. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if you have you a, were quick on the yes to the mammoth. I noticed. I, <laughs> was but so I quick. was going to go on. The mammoth is a is a very special case for me, because as far as I understand, mammoths bit it for two reasons: one, because of uh, of, of the, the the end of the ice age; two, because of people overhunting them. So, if there was a way to bring back something that we kind of knocked off the planet because we got you know we got super excited about you know hunting elephants, uh, that's kind of cool. Humans, I don't know. I mean, that would actually have to be up to the person you're trying to clone if they wanted that or not. Like oh, if it was me, if it was me, I don't know. I don't think the world needs another me, but if it was someone else and like they lost a sibling or something, but you had enough, enough of their cells to, to, to clone them. I mean, I think maybe that decision should be left up to them. Yeah, I don't yeah, know what John Hogan did in the chat room, uh, uh, bringing back Neanderthal. I didn't think of it as bringing back a, a currently alive person. But like Would a you... long, like a, a distant cousin, of the Neanderthal or the Denisovans. Denisovans. Bring well, them back. that would be similar to cloning a mammoth. That would be yeah. that kind of right. a question. Recently but what about a living person? Would you clone a living person? I mean, it gets weird, right? Because, okay, let's say, you know, Roger's alive and well, and we clone right. Roger. Well, then it's a Roger baby. So it's not like yeah. we just have two Rogers that are like carbon yeah. copies of each other. It would be so my... it's like it it the whole thing it would take a long time to if for some reason you wanted a replica yeah. 
you know, there you got you got forty years we got to deal with here. Give yeah, or and, take. Sorry, and, the, and there's all the external <laughs> stimulus, right, that create a person. It's not just yeah. the, the gene set. I've thought about that in regards to cloning pets. Yeah. Where mm -hmm. I thought like, oh, you know, my I loved our dog Django. She was the best. She's been mentioned on Twist before, yeah. uh, and I. I I thought I've thought about would I clone that dog and I'm like no because it wouldn't be Django mm -hmm. it would be a dog very much like her in many respects yeah. but it wouldn't have her experiences and 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 even with a dog there are experiences that shape their personalities uh much more so with a human I, I would think yeah I think um Animals, humans, there are genetic aspects to personality, but there is definitely, I mean, we talk about it all the time, Blair, nature versus nurture, where it that it's environmental both. factor is huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you want to take like the very, the very far out non-emotional look, if you're looking just at populations and conservation and the success of species, you don't clone humans because there's too many of us. So that's out the window. <laughs> but then if you're going to take the resources to clone a species, and it's resources, I mean, you know, money and, and manpower, but I also mean the, the niche, the space, the, the space to keep them, the food they will be eating, and the fact that they have to be eaten by something. If you want to take that space and put something in it, it makes way more sense to put something in that space that currently has an established niche rather than something that does not. And so I think that's that's where the whole mammoth argument always comes up. And uh, the, the situation like the Black-Footed Fair, they are currently, there's only about 250 of them, but they currently are in the wild. They have a habitat, they have a prey, they have competitors. And so it would be very easy and good for the environment to put them back in there. But with mammoths, you have to disrupt a lot of things to make a space for them in an ecosystem. Yeah, you have which to create might, mammoth park. Out. Yeah, but you, that also then might build out its own biome. I mean, like we've talked about uh, with reintroducing the beaver or the, the gray wolf. It creates this whole other ecosystem around it that can actually build a more diverse bio, uh, bi biodiversity in the area. But that's but something yeah, that was I, just I gone, mean, and this is something that is going to displace current ten thousand species. years. That's nothing. Yes, but those that's mammoths nothing. will displace species that currently are alive and potentially push them to extinction. We are already and doing any it. extinct, any cloned extinct species is essentially an invasive species, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so is it actually technically, if you start to look at it. Everything's about to be an invasive species with global warming because as every creature has to change <laughs> its territories at different rates, they're all going to move together. It's not going to be like, ready? Uh, one degree, count of three, one, two. All right, let's move. They're going to go piecemeal. We Everything's going to overlap. It's yeah, going to make me. But we didn't directly. It. We may have caused that to happen, but we didn't do it directly. Right. Like actually putting an Two animal. Two wrongs into don't make a, a right, place. Justin. That's all. I'm saying. Oh no! But at some <laughs> at some point, the, I'm saying that at some point, there's the the rules don't really apply. To what's nature? What's the natural state of any region or area? Or how it's been for the last, you know, twenty thousand years doesn't isn't going to count in a hundred years. I just want my Cenozoic Park. You know, you can't have Jurassic Park, but you could probably you could have feasibly, Cenozoic. Yeah, you could you could have like a. A couple of a couple of mammoths, no mastodons, maybe some cyber tooth cats, maybe a woolly rhino, maybe three. Yeah. What about the giant sloth? Giant, yeah, sloth. giant sloths. Cool. I'd love one of those. Giant ground sloths. I love that. Yeah. How would you know? <laughs> if they were alive, they could be very mean. And then you well, would love that them. doesn't mean I don't love them. <laughs> Blair only doesn't love animals if they attack her or if they don't want to exist. So fair. Yes. <laughs> like I, I think this is a fascinating conversation because, I mean, 20 years ago, before Dolly, before the first cloned animal, the first cloned sheep, this was such a sci-fi conversation, mm -hmm. and I don't think that science and tech and that people were having the conversation at the level that we're having. I mean, I mean, we're pretty high level folks, but, you know, 
people weren't having this kind of a conversation about cloning. It was, yeah. oh my God, upsetting the universe. And suddenly we're like talking nuance about when and where and yeah. how. We cloned those ferrets, so I guess that's okay. What else should we do? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, my last question is very techy. Would you get a neural prosthetic? Would you, you get like, Elon Musk's chip in your head? Would you get uh, So so this is the prosthetic that can interpret like your elect the your brain signals, your nerve signals, right? Right. Yeah. Um well, I mean, I think if you could regain functionality that you had lost with a hand or a, or a leg or an eye uh, or an ear, uh, uh, I, I would think, yes, I, I absolutely would. Anyone else? I mean, it depends. Like, if it's safe and there's no weird, like, downside, like someone being able to control your motor functions. Um, ah, your arm is no longer your arm. Yeah, like, <laughs> that would be kind of weird. Like, oh, I've been Definitely hacked. need multi-factor authentication. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I mean, if even if you weren't weren't like replacing a, 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 a something that was in, you know that like a lost limb or something, and it could give you the ability to like remotely drive your car, maybe that'd be mm -hmm. kind of cool. I mean, right. like you know, like that's where it gets less obvious to me is like, okay, where should the line be drawn, or should there yeah. be? One? Should you be allowed to control anything with your brain that we can let you control? I mean, you know, the right. argument, of course, being. How is that any different than you using a smartphone in your hand, doing the same commands to, to, to remotely activate your automobile or, or to yeah. activate your bank account? It's just a lot of the, the middleman of an appendage and, and a mm, device. Mm -hmm. a lot, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could argue that, that the phone. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, it's, it's just I was, yeah, it was just reiterating what he was saying too. A lot yeah. of the, the sexiness of that is kind of gone when you can just do a voice command out loud and make a thing happen yeah i mean you could almost think of if you're holding a smartphone and you're doing something remotely it's an extension of your arm because what if it was just under your skin you know i mean it's clearly it isn't you could sort of think of it that way i'm all for this um i had a I had a bum shoulder uh, at the end of last year and it's better now, but it took a while. And, you know, yeah. during that time when I was feeling sorry for myself, I was like, what if it just never gets better? You know, cause you mm -hmm. don't know if it's, you know, when you're really in a lot of pain and you're, and you're injured and anything that anyone could have, it, you could have knocked on my door in a weird suit and been like, would you, <laughs> would you like a neural prosthetic? Your shoulder will be healed. I'd say, yep, I do. Feels like we're a little bit in the writer's room, uh, you know, like from 20, 30, 50 years ago, we're sitting in the writer's room. I think we should be able to control like screens by moving a hand. Now, I think it'd be better if we said a word because people are just going to think we're waving like a mad person. Yeah, but then we're talking to ourselves. That's going to look crazy. You know, it would be even better. What if we had a little plug that, just, you, jack, you know, we're kind of trying to create the way that we live in this mythical supernatural future. But yeah. uh, well, because because I I actually would prefer to be able to just think something at a at a voice assistant than say it, uh, because sometimes it doesn't really understand me, which I guess could be true of reading my brain as well. But especially when I'm out and about on a walk, I don't want to have to say it in front of other people that are around, you know, walking around too. It's it would be nicer if I could just keep it to myself. But that doesn't make good TV, right? But, it's like, yeah. oh, that, we can't just have people walking around TV. silently. But that also happen. means you have, you don't have the chaos of inner conversations that are taking place here, where for no apparent reason, I only for half a second thought about a snack. It didn't mean to open the fridge. Now it's closed again, but now the I, cupboard's open. And now the TV's on, because remember that show? And then... We talked something about radio and it turned on all of a sudden. I didn't mean to do that. And but, I can't but, shut I mean, it off. Your, your hand doesn't wildly uh, fly up every time you think about throwing a ball, right? There's different yes, ways does. of controlling it. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Stop saying that. Actually, the worst is, is kind of my, uh, like implant to implant communication where you're just like, I'm talking to Sarah, but instead of using an I am client or anything, I'm just using, you know, you're thinking, thinking about it. it. And then yeah. you have that like, like deviation of a the inner monologue that somehow just bleeds through and you know suddenly sarah's 
you know, learning why I hate the, you know, the, the checkout. Oh, or that. much, or much, much more personal. Yeah. You no, know? I mean, boy, if, uh, <laughs> if your brain is being shared with me, it's like, you gotta be really specific about which folder. Which uh -huh. am I sharing with Sarah? Yeah, well, some, some people, some people already <laughs> lack the filter, right? In a conversation. I don't share my computer with things. people. I am not you sharing my brain know. with people. Permissions oh, are you. very important no when sharing your brain. <laughs> Uh, I wanted yeah. to throw in this too because John, uh, who who suggested this topic, was talking about Star Trek Voyager and biological processors. It's one thing to say, "Would you like your brain to control something? Would you like brains that are processors to be in your devices?" Like like Cellular. biological? Yeah, or yeah, like, yeah, like a biological processor. So, I mean, it's very nice slime mold phone. Yes. Yeah. No. They, so they've they've been creating with. Uh, Basically, biological computers like DNA based. Mm -hmm. DNA computing is a thing. Yep. And one of the things they found is they're great at parallel tasks, but they're really slow, right, compared to a, a digital computer. So instead of counting things out in milliseconds or nanoseconds, you're talking minutes, hours, days, months. Um, but they're really good at parallel processing stuff. So it's really just finding a data set that is most applicable to that kind of processing power. I think it would be great. I mean, you know, I you know the whole going back to Voyager. There's that whole episode where the gel pack neural packs get a cold or like a flu or something. They're all sick and the the half the ship's down. Um, I mean, do you? I mean, when you have that, do you have to worry about things like oh, I got to vaccinate? Like when you talk about antivirus and vaccinating your computer, yeah. you're, you know, you're actually injecting something into it. It's kind of cool. I mean. You know, the idea being that the human brain or, or a biological brain can do feats that we haven't yet been able to replicate uh, using a, a binary digital machine. But I, that would be kind of cool. I think my only question would be, would they be robust? Like, would you be able to have something portable? I drop my phone on the floor and as long as I have a screen protector, it still works. Like, would my computer, if I had a biological computer, suddenly have a concussion? And then Maybe, I yeah. I mean, while, or... we have good meat suits to carry our processor around, you yeah. know, like, but they do get Sometimes concussions. Good. Sometimes yeah. lets us down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you take your meat suit and throw it off a cliff, you're bound to <laughs> potentially have some issues. I mean, you got to be careful. Yeah. I mean, it's just a material, right? It's it's it easy to, to think like, oh, it's DNA. It's going to have, it's going to be fragile. It's like, it's everything in technology can be fragile. You just, you have to, you have to harden it. You have to figure out how to protect it. Uh, you don't want your yeah. DNA, DNA to get a literal virus. <laughs> I love the idea though, of being able to communicate with other biological entities through information. So mm. um, there's a group, Backyard, Backyard Brains, that's been developing these experimental kits for classrooms and for kids to be able to basically plug your nervous system into all sorts of things and control devices. And they showed that you can you can use your arm and your electric signals of your of your arm to stimulate mimosa plants to close their leaves or um, uh, Venus flytrap fly traps mm. to close and to you can you can actually use human physical electrochemical stimuli and transmit it to a plant to force them to do things so is there a back the the, the feedback from that can we learn the signals that mm -hmm. plants are giving their electrochemical conversations to be able to understand what they're talking about we talk about communication in dolphins or gorillas or other intelligent animals but what about communication in plants and can we learn that on a basic data level which i think would be really interesting grow the tomatoes round i think yes. about it yeah. <laughs> i mean it, it'd be kind of interesting i mean it would be sort of like aquaman except instead of talking to the fishes you're just talking to your crops talking like, to your crops oh are you oh, fighting it, off so it, pests it right now ivy oh thing. are you yeah. fine <laughs> poison ivy superhero poison ivy poison yeah. ivy exactly oh, super villain, villain. yes yeah <laughs> She's a villain to some, hero to others, I suppose. Yeah, she's but as long as my corn is sweet and it pops in the microwave, it's all good. All right. Well, that... uh, we have one more uh, listener-suggested topic. Kiki, yeah. should we get on to that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so Sandy uh, had, had written in about NFTs and blockchain and power consumption. Um, and I would like us to talk about that from the perspective of responsible science communication, responsible technology uh, reporting, uh, I've held off uh, reporting a lot of the claims of blockchain energy use because it was a lot of claims 
and sometimes, not always, but sometimes even some false comparisons. Uh, but we don't have a lot of science. There's a little bit, but we don't have a lot about what's actually happening, what the actual impacts are. Recently, there was a peer-reviewed journal article in Nature Communications that we talked about on DTNS that actually did some looking at like, okay, how much power does this use? What effect does it have? Uh, I'd like to see more of that work done on it. Uh, and I thought we could all talk about our various lines of where we say like, oh wait, that's that's not worth talking about because that's not real science or tech. Uh, that one's close enough that we could talk about it a little, or that's that's solid. That's something that we can really we can really dig into, and we won't be misleading people because it's it's got real, uh, you know, either real technology or real science behind it. Yeah. So for the NFTs, I mean, generally. I'm steering clear of those on twist, but we have talked about the blockchain and the energy consumption. Um, we have had those stories many times because it's been a concern for a while as to how much how much energy is being used. But there is that that question of how does it compare? Like mm -hmm. where does it really truly stack up? And I think this is one of the hardest questions to really parse an answer for. Um, being able to understand how any industry impacts at all of its levels um, environmentally, what energy uses, where does the energy come from? How is it, how is it being implemented? Um, I mean, I think with technology, we do know like Google servers, Facebook servers, all these things you use so much energy. And then, you know, my, my computer right now is, yeah, and the, and the screen that I'm using, every house is using more and more power as a result of these these technologies being well, online. Well, but, I, that's, I think we're using less individually. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because we have more power-efficient yeah. devices, right? Yeah. The refrigerator, I was we're talking about this, like, I think it's the refrigerator uh, and your house lights. If you've done the switch over to the LEDs or just some more modern, efficient light bulbs, uh, you're using less electricity than uh, than you were without them, right? You're yeah. using like less than half. Like a, a, one of the most expensive appliances in the household used to be the refrigerator, and now it runs like a, what a 30, 40 watt light bulb. It's almost nothing compared to what it used to be. So we're the more efficient we get, the more we keep pushing for solar to also be part of the mm. the equation. The less we're actually going to need to be generating per individual. The other yeah. side is, of course, there's a lot more of us, and we have a lot of the world that's yeah. Still these blocks, these server the farms, these server farms, very often are being placed in places where renewable, sustainable energy is is dominant. So, I mean, I know Google and Facebook have server farms that are out mm -hmm. in the Dalles, out out the Columbia River, because there's amazing water and wind power out there, and they're taking advantage of that free energy almost free energy, um, to be able to power their needs. And then I, we know that this is happening also in, in China and other places for the blockchain servers. Yeah, I there's mean, a, Microsoft is doing data servers uh, off the coast of Scotland that are wave powered uh, and even water cooled. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of good experiments happening there. So, so it's when I see this thing that's like, you know, block, blockchain uses as much power as Denmark. I'm like, well, I bet you could say that about a lot of things. There's a little cherry picking going on. Totally. There, right? uh, you know, and, and, and so I'm like, tell me something more useful. It's not that I don't believe that the blockchain is using a lot of energy. I, I know it is, but how much really? And, and one of the pieces of research that I'm hoping someone's doing and I can't wait to see is what is the financial industry not on the blockchain do? Right, because yeah. there's a lot of servers and there's a lot of a lot of buildings and telecommunications and people in offices uh, that are causing transfers of money right now. It takes three days mm -hmm. on this this really ancient network uh, to get money around. How much power does that whole system use versus if we did it all on the blockchain? And mm -hmm. and if it turns out that the blockchain's worse, then okay, that's good to know. It's like all right, then it, we're not saving I, power I there. I, you know, and so, some of it is the, uh, the argument isn't directly, although tangentially related to the blockchain, but it's like when you're mining cryptocurrency, you know, it, the, the argument goes, and I'm, I'm not arguing one way or, or against it, but like you are processing or you, you're, you're literally processing 
uh, in the argument for nothing. You're just you're you're creating a, a token, especially if it's not a, a, a mate like a well-known, uh, like a Bitcoin or something like it. it's like a new cryptocurrency. So the argument is that like, should we be doing that at all? And oftentimes the argument kind of, I, I kind of what we've done here is we've devolved it into a simple, you know, like it, it's using a lot of energy or it's not. And it should be more about, are there smarter ways to go about doing this instead of having what we have right now, like server farms to, you know, to crunch, Away every every time you you make an adjustment, the, the 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 blockchain ledger needs to be updated. If it needs to be updated in multiple places, then all those places are going to require. I, I think Roger, yeah. I think I think where you're going with this uh, is there's there's different ways of doing blockchain mining. There's proof of work yeah. and proof of stake, and a lot of people say, well, proof of work uses a lot more energy than proof of stake, mm -hmm. so proof of stake is preferable, uh, and that's a that's a part of the conversation too. Is is there is there a more power efficient way? to to process these things and i yeah. think that is also an important conversation uh is, is your block we, we've hit on a bunch of them is your blockchain running on renewable power well then the amount of energy it's using isn't as much of a concern as it is concern, yeah. if it's on polluting power is your blockchain uh doing proof of work or proof of stake if, if one's going to use less power okay so that's good too it, the, you're right it's not a simple answer uh and and there are a lot of different ways to approach the problem Sarah, do you remember we did Green Energy, that show years ago, talking about- Green Tech Today. Green yes. Tech Today, yes. yes. I mean, do you see there being a, a, a change in the conversation around technology and power? And do you think there's been, in the last 10 years, any kind of um, evolution there? Well, I mean, when you talk about power as- uh, okay, so you know, when you say something like, ooh, green tech, it's like, um, you know, saving the earth, sustainability, you know, lots of buzzwords. And some people kind of go, eh, I don't really care about that. Well, you care about it if it costs you less. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that's where it's a lot of people have gotten hooked to, okay, alternative energy or new energy that can either create wealth or or um, back away from the cost of things that we've all gotten used to. Everybody loves that. And I think that the kind of, you know, I don't want to call it hippy dippy because I think green technology is really important, but, but the, but the, the, the connotations that some people have about the, the future of, of energy and being able to harvest it more responsibly and more intelligently. Uh, I think a lot of people have come around to that. Whereas in the past it was um, maybe f uh, thought of as a lot more fringe. Yeah. Yeah. I really hope that moving forward, especially where we are with climate change, carbon, uh, carbon emissions and the increase in global temperature and everything that's happening. I hope that technologists who are, applying the sciences to these to blockchain to anything really like even the phone in your hands where are you sourcing your materials mm -hmm. can you cradle to grave all of the resources that are needed to create the thing that you're creating can you take account for all of the all of the resources and assets that are needed i mean yeah i it needs I think, to be I part think, of that consideration right yeah that's absolutely the the biggest piece in this question that I think is not being asked is when you talk about environmental impact, this is one piece. This is just one very small piece of your environmental impact. So sure, you could say that Bitcoin is terrible for the environment because it takes a bunch of energy, but there are other things out there that have other impacts on our environment that aren't as well quantified or modified. And I think that is really the, the, the problem is that we need to find a way to assess the, the monetary impact on our environment more completely. And th that's where, mm -hmm. first of all, not all energy is created equal, but then did you cut down a forest to build this warehouse that you have these servers in? What What is the whole, complete, comprehensive environmental impact of that thing that you're asking about? Yeah, and, and, and that's why I am, I'm really wanting somebody to compare that, like current banking industry, to running the industry mm -hmm. on a blockchain, 
because what I don't want to happen is, oh, blockchain bad, shut it down. And then we end up using more power and wasting more power because we're using this old fashioned version that we're all used to. So we just grandfathered it in when it's like, well, yeah. as bad as it was, it may have used less power than that. I don't, I'm not, and I'm not saying that is true. We may look at it and go, oh no, blockchain bad. You were right, right? But let's find <laughs> out. This is, this is very much like the healthcare debate. How are you going to pay for it? Okay, well, the first thing is you don't have this whole insurance industry in the middle taking profit. Oh, so you're going to put people out of work. Wait a sec. I thought we were talking about the cost. It'll it'll shift quick, right? The, I if mean, you try to yeah. attack banking in any way. I mean, par yeah. part of it is there's so many. It comes in so many directions, right? It's 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 the resources you use. It's the uh, it's the mon what, what Blair was saying. It's the monetary impact uh of 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 certain businesses that do and do not i mean the, the thing is there's going to be winners and losers and everything but the goal is to ma make it so that there are more winners than losers in any kind of you know strategy that you work out and it's it's i mean that's how it goes for everything like when they when, when we moved away from horses to to internal combustion engines there are sure a lot of people had stables that suddenly oh i have, I have no more customers no one's bringing in their horse for me to feed and take care of it till they take it out again. Yeah, I can't sell but, any I, of my buggy whips anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little concerned though about like the uh, worrying about making finding out what the economic impact of any of these things. Are. It. The, Be, oh, I'm sorry. Because I what if what if it what because what if it comes out the other way? What if the math comes out? You know, actually, actually the math actually works out. We're all going to have a really good short-term economic boost if we all stick with horses. Or whatever it is, or if, well, we, if mean, we tear down all the trees in the Amazon, we're going to have a net profit to the planet that will overcome short term, the, right? <laughs> short -term whatever, profit. Yeah. Well, I mean, we and, get, and, I mean, we, that's that's. We might not I mean, like the answer when, if we well, just the, put the, the things in terms thing. of money. There, there are answers, but there are profit. also interpretations of an answer. One answer you could give would be like. For for people who are making money logging the forest, yeah, let me just raise the entire Amazon and then make mint. But for people whose welfare derives from the Amazon being a standing forest, no, that it, that impacts them adversely. If you talk about the cities that are next to that now have to deal with a bunch of smoke and haze every day because there are no more standing forests. I mean, like, like I said, there's going to be winners and losers, and the goal is that... A so bulk... who's doing the survey? Who's doing the accounting? Who's saying that... For the greater good of the rest of the planet, I'm sorry, Brazil. Or I'm sorry, Interior mm -hmm. and Forest listen, Dweller. Listen, no, right. they're just giving the good awards to Costa Rica. They're like, Costa Rica, you're doing amazing. We love I realize, you. I realize that your straw men are very afraid of this question, but <laughs> I'd actually really like to know what the question, what the answer is, before I assume what the, the negative problems would be. Yeah. We are going to move away from energy, the environment, NFTs. Who even needs those things anyway? Whatever. That's just money laundering. But <laughs> we have questions to ask each other. We have some trivia. Hmm? Yes. Ooh. A little trivia. Is, yes. every, is anybody ready for a little friendly competition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do we uh, want to encourage our chat rooms to help or do we want them yes. to be quiet? <laughs> I want the chat rooms to instant message me with all of the correct answers. Oh, correct answers. Well, at that point, well, then I should have redone my question. I'm oh. just going to second what Justin says. <laughs> I yes, just, also send just assume I'm doing a call, a call home for help every question. Yes. <laughs> all right, but we have, we're going to alternate... Science and tech, science and tech. I've got questions that Blair helped me put together. Justin and Roger has questions that he and the DTNS news team put together. So are you ready to rumble? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. And really, really, the answers to these questions uh, will be of interest to everyone, and you'll learn something. So really, everybody's going to win. Yeah. Everybody wins. But, but give, let, 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 these, let the Twiz guys just... Give them a few seconds to suss out before you give them the answer chat room. I I am very, very <laughs> fearful of the tech questions. I'm so scared. I'm just saying, <laughs> right now, I'm like, oh my God. Explain what Listen, an NFT is. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> which jumpers no, do you switch no. on a motherboard in order to, no, you know, no. simple stuff. Red, black, yellow? No, what? NFT I stands for national football teams. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's the Washington nickname. That's right. Okay, I have my first question. 
What organ has been adapted by green tree frogs to help them hear in the noisy tropical jungle environment? Is it A, their skin, B, the tongue, C, the lungs, D, the stomach? Which organ has been adapted by green tree frogs to help them hear? Uh, I can picture the skin. Story. I, I mean, tongue, I, I have a guess. Lungs, but stomach. I don't. Yeah, it, lung or skin, Sarah? Which is your guess? I was going to say skin. Yeah, skin for me. Daily Tech News Show has so, unanimously said final skin. Final answer. <laughs> I didn't know it was supposed to be multiple choice. That that's. Justin, I hope you know this. I know Blair no, knows I, it. I, I, it's between C <laughs> and B. This is from like two weeks ago. It's this is from C a story. Can... All of the questions are from stories on I the show. I remember you like, talking about it. this story, and I'm told, I remember I, I where I was. Picture... I was folding my laundry when you did the story, and I can't remember <laughs> what the answer is. But the problem was the picture that we put up didn't go with the story. Correct. So this big bubble, I don't know if that's the thing that was yeah, actually... Yeah, so they showed the throat expanding. Um, yes. They were doing bucopharyngeal breathing in the picture, but that had nothing to do with it. No. So I put C. I was stuck with lung, but I don't think it's right. The answer is C, the lungs. Ah. Mm. Should have known. Yeah. I figured yes. something to do with the nerves. The inflation of the lungs changes the way that the ears, uh, that the tympanum of the ears of the frog vibrate. And so it uh, makes it easier for them hear, to hear the calls of their loved ones over the noise of the jungle. It's tightly tuned when they inhale, it tunes There's them. Nature's tympanies. Yes. Yeah. <gasps> I hear you. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, all right, Roger. Your all turn. right, so mine isn't a multi multiple choice answer. So oh, okay. Then we're gonna, definitely. I did all. We did all. Room. I did all multiple <laughs> choice for you guys. All right. So uh, okay. This should be pretty simple. He is popularly known as the father of the World Wide Web. You talking about Al Gore? <laughs> a Al Gore. <laughs> no, no. I know who the guy is. And it's, it's or is like it the guy was... who owns the dump trucks? No. <laughs> I, no, I can, I can, a, I can give you multiple nickel. choices. He made uh, not a nickel Tom, off of it. Tom, Tom can give you multiple choices. Okay, so I'm going to say... Oh, go ahead. What is it? T Tim Berners-Lee? Tim yes. Berners-Lee? Yes. You got Did it. Did I get it right? Yes. Oh. Yeah, so Kiki's our, our team captain. I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Tim Berners-Lee, Vince Cerf. I've met Vince Cerf. Wasn't Vince Cerf. Tim I was going to throw Vince Cerf, Bill Gates, and Al Gore in as multiple choice <laughs> options. Yeah, so. There we go. You didn't need them. You didn't need them. Right. Oh, I got it. I got it. We'll I got it. We'll okay. the next one. Okay, next question. Which of the following is not known to be represented by the mathematical astronomy of the ancient Greek Antikythera mechanism. A. Lunar eclipses. B. Movement of Neptune. C. The Olympiad cycle. D. Years and seasons. Well, that would be the movement of Neptune. You're right. Yeah, because they didn't know about Neptune back in I the didn't. day of the Antikythera. <laughs> Good job. Five, five mm -hmm. planets. Five yeah. planets, though. Mercury, Venus, Earth. Mars. Mars, and Jupiter. And Jupiter, yeah. Yeah. And the sun and the moon. And other stars. Like, they, mm -hmm. it was very complicated. But, yeah, you got it right. Good job. Yay. No Neptune. Okay. All right. This should be. Hey. Got all bees. I got. I see all those bees in there in that chat room. Good job, team. <laughs> this one isn't too esoteric. This electronic instrument is played without physical contact, often used when music and sound effects are needed for an eerie situation. Oh yeah, oh, that's my the favorite. Theremin. Oh, yeah. you got. It. I want to, I like theremins. So Those are fun. fun. Oh my gosh. Okay. The mRNA based vaccines used by Pfizer and Moderna work by A, altering your DNA, 
B. Infecting you with dead virus. C. Using your cellular machinery. D. Entering the cell nucleus. C. That is C. correct. Yay. Yay. All of the others are myths that have been perpetuated <laughs> by people who don't like vaccines. <laughs> the mRNA-based vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna just stimulate your body to make antibodies. Yeah, to make the to stuff get your immune system to go. Mm -hmm. yes. I, who yeah. doesn't want to be stimulated? In this like case, that. do shoot the messenger RNA <laughs> into your shoulder. <laughs> All right. I like your joke. Here's another. Here's here's another softball. Another okay. name for expressing data size in the base two numeral system. Oh no! What? Say what? Yeah, say it again. <laughs> another... it, I don't think saying it again will help, Blair. To be honest with you, we like, could say what? it again. We could what say it, it slower, louder. Is that binary? Oh yeah, bit. you got it. Oh, okay. there we go. I win! I win! I win! Okay. I thought. Wait, I thought it was. I thought it was other than binary. Oh, see, I overthought it. <laughs> no, he said in the base two, not except for. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Uh... Oh my goodness. My brain worked. That was really good. Yay. Yeah, good job. Woo woo. Okay. Uh the largest single creature on earth is A an aspen grove. B a slime mold. C a blue whale. D a fungus. A I think it's That's a fungus. I think it's I'm with I'm with I think, I think it's, it's the, the aspen egg. grove. It's the one where it's, if it's not the fungus, it's the aspen grove. But I it's think a it's the... fungus. Ah! It's a honey mushroom in the Malheur Forest in uh, eastern central Oregon. Yeah, and so, it is the largest single organism because of the mycelium that's connected all underneath the ground. However, it is only like barely more like the aspen grove is the close second. It's uh, it's the source of all the honey mushroom sauce. That's <laughs> right. Oh, and, I'm sorry, I lost it for everyone. Mm, oh, whatever. And the honey badgers. Yeah. All right. I had that one too. I got that one. Here's a sciencey one for you. Ooh. Okay, science. What techie. theory of physics must clocks aboard the GPS satellite or satellites compensate for to maintain accuracy? I don't see my co-host saying, so I'm going to say general relativity. Yeah, you got it. Okay. So, Extra points for general. So uh, just... some, some some small tidbits of information. Uh, yeah. Uh, orbiting because of the G, because GPS satellites orbit the Earth and above the Earth, they actually go their, their clocks tick a little faster by forty five microseconds a day. So if That's they're not lot. adjusted, they'll be off by thirty eight microseconds every day. And it's very important because those microseconds can mean yards and if you let it drift any longer miles away from your actual point then that's not good for gps no yeah. no because no but you can you can actually see in the in the global information system databases uh some very old plotting that was done compared to where things are now and that you can have that exact sort of scenario take place where you have people have plotted streams uh, and and they're now they're yards they're yards off of where they had initially plotted them into the, the city. curse of time dilation. <laughs> In our mm -hmm. Twitch chat, people are saying curse. it's not fair. She's a doctor. She cheated by studying her whole life and being smart. <laughs> 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 oh, studying. What does it? What good does that do anybody? <laughs> All right, y'all. What happens when a sea slug's head is cut off? The head grows a body. The head and body die. The body buds baby slugs. The body grows a head. I would say the body grows a head. What do you guys think? Mm, I thought I, I remember this story, and the, the, the real answer is all of the clickbaity headlines get it wrong. <laughs> That's true. Uh, maybe, yeah. actually, though, if it comes from the head, maybe the head grows another body. I think that's that, right. That, that makes more sense. Feels I, right. will, I, will, I will defer to these two. All right. And the head answer grows a body. is the head grows a body. Yay. See, we just had to talk through it. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Which is kind of crazy because it's a pretty complex organism, and it doesn't just regrow. It, like it regrows its heart. It regrows. Yeah, it re- right. Regrows that was everything. what was so crazy about. Finds its soul. Um, <laughs> if you cut off a sea I'm... slug's head, where does its soul go? Well, the best I... part is they didn't cut it off, or the the scientists didn't cut it off. The sea slug severed it off. Oh it right, that's fell. right. They, they cut their off their own, own heads. Head. It yeah. was a personal yeah. choice. What are they? Yeah. A it was a lifestyle choice. Yes. <laughs> Wait, is that how they reproduce? They just cut the heads off? No, well, actually, no, they it... reproduce by stabbing each other in the face with their uh, phallus, actually. so Oh. They don't use their eye stalks in any sort of reproductive manner? No. 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 Uh, not after not they've visual. been stabbed. That's hard to <laughs> lie to me. Uh, in 1952, <laughs> Grace Hopper developed this important concept in computer programming. Oh. That led to the creation of the modern program, uh, the modern computer programming language. Oh, what did? Ho- oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't know this one at all. Grace Hopper, programming language, programming. I'll go with the the, is it the C punch plus cards. One? <laughs> uh, is it the? Pascal, what was the? All right, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get. I've got uh, multiple choices for you. It sounds like a type of candy you would eat. I don't know how long. Yeah, let's hear the multiple choice. Uh, Multiple choices. Is it A, compiling, B, coding, C, bugs, or D, recursive logic? Just coding. Did she make coding? No. Program yet. I'm gonna go with the logic, the one that said logic in the word. Recursive logic. This sounds old because people have. I need to learn this. What did time. Grace Hopper do? She's a big name in in history. She, she created the concept of a compiler, which is essentially compiler. a compiler. When you program, they make a programming language that makes it as easy or easier to to uh, to write instructions to a computer. The thing is, the computer uses what they call machine language, which is really unintelligible to most people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next step above that is what they call assembly, which is a lot of uh, a lot of memory memory locations and data that's supposed to go into it. If you've ever done it outside of a C64, it's very, very complex. It can be very confusing because they, it shifts from whatever hardware you're on. Computer languages are designed to solve that by taking relatively com- uh, relatively uh, normal sounding phrases like, you know, initiate or int library to bring up a library or uh, set or set, print hello or print hello or, print or hello. echo yes. off or echo on. And what a compiler does is takes those and then directs it to a memory map into a into a into a form that the machine will understand. And it's originally called linking. And the compiler is the program that does the linking, it takes all those phrases that you type out. It's why when you compile a program, if you just leave it in the source code, it could be kind of big. But once you compile it, it should be a bit smaller. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to write the, out zero one zero 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 yeah. one. You just say, like, move this here and call it a day. Interesting. Paul Sampson is saying, hello, world. Surely? Sure. Surely. Well, hello, you still win, world. Kiki. <laughs> so there's that. All right. I'm glad. Thank you for that. I learned something that was very good. Which of the following is not an official scientific term? Muon, Shmoo, Sonic Hedgehog, Zelda. Shmoo? No, no, no. Because I know Sonic Hedgehog is. Yep. Muon. I know what a a Muon is. So unless it's a trick question. Maybe it's Zelda. I think it's Zelda. It is Zelda. Oh, Good yay. job. Yeah, yeah I tried to throw us off with two There's video no, I've games. I've heard of Shmoo before. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. What's Shmoo? So yeah, I have two, I have two is, even uh, though I don't remember what it is anymore. A Shmoo is involved in yeast reproduction. Uh, yeah. So I could this, have sworn I, I, it was tickling the back of my brain that I'd heard of a Zelda connection, but I guess not. Yeah. Nope. That's why, Kiki, I, that's why I threw that in there. What, what our listeners want to know, and definitely I know already, so I'm just asking for them, is what is a sonic hedgehog? It's a protein, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a protein, and there's also a gene that underlies it. Yeah, so geneticists just got, it, it was around the time that the video the, game came out. Is it the gene that makes the protein? Is that the, what yeah. sonic hedgehog? Oh, okay. Yep. And yeah, it's the gene that makes the protein and geneticists 
really liked the video game. <laughs> so geeky geneticists named their gene after a video game, Sonic Hedgehog. Isn't it one of the reasons that they've come up with a like a list of rules for naming now? That you, that, <laughs> like, no, I'm serious. I think there's like yeah. a, con a convention on naming because they're like, we, we can't let people keep calling stuff Sonic Hedgehog. Like, you, you can't just make things video games. Then suddenly there is a Zelda. That's which no there fun. Isn't. Yeah. Well, there was a Zelda before, I, but... I like the pop cultural references in the sciences. It makes things easier to remember. Yeah. True. If oh, Sonic Mike Hedgehog oh. was called something else, I would never think of it ever again. Uh, <laughs> or maybe you would know this. Then the it's, it's, wait. So we're are how's the scoring? Like team Twiz w wins by one. We all win. We all Yay. win. So, so what is? Have... Oh, I, I just want to ask you this real quick question, Kiki. Since okay. you love pop science or pop culture and science, what is the name of the spikes on the Stegosaurus's tail? Phil and <laughs> Sam. Jeff. Jeff? Is it Jeff? Great. No. I don't know. It's, it's Thagomizer. And it's the based Thagomizer. On a, yes. based on a, it's based on a Gary Larson uh, strip known as uh, The Far Side of the Galaxy. Love that. And he, he did one where they had cavemen showing, like, a depict, like, doing a little. Uh, 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 a talk on the stegosaurus and he in this he's talking about the stegosaurus tale about how to, you should avoid it and we've calling it the thagomizer in uh, respect to the late great thag whatever who got smushed by one. who got smushed by the tail oh yeah nice. far side was one of the great great far side yeah, it really was my my 10 year old yeah. kai is is getting into the far side right now mm. It there is. was an amazing exhibit at the california academy of sciences when i was growing up of far side Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. I, wait, well, yeah. how old were you when you? Do I remember? I was in I was in college, I think, when I saw that, right or no? Maybe earlier. Oh, I've I been so know. I've been there so many times before they redid it yeah. that it's all a blur. It's just one giant thing. And they mm -hmm. had the fish tank, you know, the mm -hmm. circular fish tank. That thing was so cool. Remember when they had the great white in it? Mm -hmm. The great white was always. And it just swimming. swam around and around yeah, and well, around, the great and it white was stop. was was being affected by the tank, and it kept swimming the other way, like opposite the the rotation of the hmm. the the tank. And it found out it's because the tank was all metal. It was throwing off the the shark's uh, sense of sense. direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Oh, that's annoying. Hmm. So many things. So yeah, great whites don't do so well in captivity for so many reasons. I think there was one additional question, which um, we'll just put it out there to the the chat room to people mm -hmm. watching. Can anybody order the host's birthdays by month and date, not year? Oh. A is Blair. B Justin. C Kiki. Tom. Sarah, Roger, can you so put not, them not, in the correct not by order year. by age? Not by but age, by, but age. by month and date. Yeah, so like if you're flipping start... through a calendar, what order yeah. would you see our birthdays? Like January. Who, well, who has like the whose birthday here? comes so first? Yeah, second, so there's there's three on that calendar right behind you. <laughs> Is this appealing to people who are like good at? You think they're good at zodiac picking, like people sign? No, no. It's, it's, <laughs> like, what are for, we doing? No, this January, February, March, April. Who comes in January? Then you know who's who's next. Justin, basically, look at people, people have to use Google, <laughs> Facebook, or whatever, figure out our old birth dates, and then arrange it in uh, correct uh, chronological I feel within like a year. We're in, in, inviting this, identity. This seems really easy. <laughs> also, what and street did you grow up on? Then send us birthday presents. Very specific. Yeah. <laughs> what was your first pet's name? This is about presents, people. <laughs> yeah. Send no, my us birthday. birthday presents. <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. Whose question was this? Who's got a birthday coming up? That's what this is. Okay. I have a birthday. We all do, really. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we didn't get one last year, so we really got to make up for it. Yeah. I would like a banana split Sunday with real hot fudge. Ooh. I would like a taco party. No one. No one's that taking a fun. crack at this in our chat rooms. <laughs> Nobody's. Oh, okay. Trying. So because that one's too hard, let's do it by age. <laughs> All right, here I'll get. I'll throw one to the uh, to the chat room without searching on Google or Wikipedia or anything. What is the largest dolphin species? I know. Oh, I know that <laughs> you one. Know, I know. I know. That's my favorite animal. Right the there. feral cat. 
What? No. <laughs> no. Largest dolphin species. Uh, uh, no, not yet. Uh, bottlenose is is one guess. Oh, oh. I know. I will send Amos, somebody socks. Amos, right? Yeah, you, you, you got it. But does Medelva, he? Delva, killer. We've got killer orca. Ulysses Adkins and and Ethan Kane both uh, said mm -hmm. killer whale first. Killer whale. Yeah. Orca. Did you guys hear about this? Uh, we did this story uh, a little over a year ago now, where where orcas were attacking fishing boats and pretty much any boat that was the size they could manage, and they would be heading out to the oh, to, yeah, to their fishing territories in Mediterranean south of France and uh, Spain, and turning them around. Mm -hmm. They would beat into them until the boat was heading back, and then they'd leave it alone. And they, they hit like a bunch of boats and they could actually track this pod because it continued right. to push boats back to shore all the way up the coast uh, to took out a fishing boat in France or something like this. They're protesting. They're telling you to go home. They were. Yeah. They were and mad then, about uh, something. And then recently, uh, some people report seeing them in the Suez Canal. Yeah. Well, that's where they, I think that's where. They, yeah. That's how that boat got stuck. Right. <laughs> right. It was the killer it whales. It's unconfirmed right. that killer Blame whales. Blame the killer the whales. Canal. I mean, oh, whether my... they're transients or residents, you just keep your distance. <laughs> OK, I think. Does that do? Is that it? Did we, we do did. it? We did. We got yes. it. Wow. We made it all the way through. Yes. This was Thank really you. fun. Yeah, this oh, was super my goodness. fun. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you all for being here. Thanks everybody for watching and listening and hanging out in the chat. Uh, and if you want to find more uh, tech news, head to dailytechnewsshow.com. Woo! Woo and if you need more science news in your life, you can head to twist.org. We will be there, sciencing it up every week. Woo -hoo -hoo! And, you know, I'd love to know what people thought about this, about this show. I'd love I'd love to get love to get feedback. Yeah. Would um, you like it? <laughs> please let us let us know on uh, whatever method works for you. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is our email address. Um, and uh, we might want to do this again if you liked it. Yeah. And thanks yeah. everyone who sent in ideas for stories and things that we should talk about. It really set us on a nice little little path of discovery and conversation. So really appreciate your interaction there. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. We mind. might want to do it again. We're going to end the show so that we can finish this one and hope to do another one in the future. Last words from everyone. Blair, what would you like to say? This is really fun. I will um, throw something out to the Twitterverse uh, since we were having our ever would you never i don't remember what we called it but um about science topics i would love to hear who actually would go to mars and why or why not mm. oh, because this never. is a science and tech conversation right and i think that it's nuanced and interesting so i would love yeah i would love to hear from people if they would like to go to mars or not and why and you can tag us in that very oh, nice Good question. All right, Justin, what are your last words? Uh, I don't know. The typical last word of a human being is cannot be said on the air. <laughs> so <laughs> I reserve it for that occasion when it re really becomes that. Now, this was really fun. I'd love to do it again as well. This was a very nice, fun, casual chat. And I actually, I, I need to watch the show more uh, the, because there's always something in your show that, that I been searching for that I've missed. Yeah. Uh, there was a very recent episode where we we're talking about you're talking about uh, outdoor projectors that they oh, don't yeah. exist yet. That once you're really designed it for a long throw. Because mm -hmm. I've been trying to find a one that you could actually mount on top of a school bus and drive around, and then actually, ideally, one that would be a periscope. Ah. So now I figure out how to take a small <laughs> one. Mount it to a periscope and yeah. be able to throw an image on anywhere the wall is handy to be able to. But I, anyway, I I'll put you in contact with we'll Marshall, Justin. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> there's always something on your show that uh, uh, sparks a lot of interest uh, when I nice. uh, listen. Sarah, your turn. Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, 
I will not be going to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't even invite me. I will not go. I'm going to stay here on Earth where we have plenty of things to solve. Thank you very much. But have fun when you go and tell me all about it. Send me oh, pictures. Oh, I'm not going. <laughs> Yeah. Well, just just whoever wants to go. I want you. I want you to enjoy your trip, Mars person. Um, and and yeah, we'll 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 have implants in our brains. and We'll just be able to talk to each other anyway. So it'll be great. But um, but yeah, real quick. This was really fun. I think so much of this week in science and daily tech news show uh we we can learn a lot from each other and we do. And let's keep let's keep the romance alive. Yeah. Absolutely. Woo. Roger, what do you have to say? Uh, this is a lot of fun. It's a great way to spend a Saturday afternoon. I will say that uh, I learned a bunch about uh, slugs and uh, giant, giant uh, fungus compared to a stand of trees that are all the same organism. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it's, you know, it's fun because science and technology are really just two sides of the same coin. And it's beneficial to, to really understand both in order to get a better appreciation of, of, of both. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, Kiki, uh, our work here is done. Uh, good, good job. Daily Tech News Show will be back Monday with Tim Stevens, and uh, I assume Twist will be back uh, next Wednesday, right? It absolutely will. 8 p.m. Pacific time. Woo-woo! It's Until all then. in your head. Should we do that again? <laughs> Until then, remember... It's all in your head. I've got the kind of mind that can